Martini. Yeah, Bruce. Who's our guest on the show today? Today we have Shamar Collins. Hi, Shamar. Good to see you again. Hi, Shamar. Good morning. How are you guys? All right. How are you? Good. It's nice to be here with you all. So what are we talking about today? I guess we could talk about solar energy. My catchphrase along the way sort of has become power to the people. I think our opportunity to harness the sun's energy can really change how our future pans out. I think your work is both on the power side and the people side, right? The technology and the kind of human uh, side of this, right? Yeah, I definitely sort of started out on the very technical research end. As of the last two years is when I got into more of the policy design and how the, the sort of funding is allocated. I think having gone through the, the research hurdles, knowing where and how to get that access to funds is really important. So I was a solar energy technology policy fellow with the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. That was the last two years. And so most recently, I've been um, serving as chief technology officer for of my company called the BME Group. So both of those angles with the BME Group doing consulting and sort of providing business solutions to different types of organizations and then learning from the solar offices policy and stakeholder engagement has really sort of complemented my technical work. So I just finished my jest. I'm, I'm getting used to being called Dr. Collins. So in 2018, I earned my doctoral degree from the University of South Florida from the Department of Electrical Engineering. My research there was basically material characterization, but for CAD telluride thin films. CAD telluride thin films are the sort of next generation for solar technology, but I've worked with all different types of solar tech. Can you tell us a little bit about the advantages of thin films? The graphic that I shared with the absorption versus wavelength really helps to demonstrate basically what those material properties are doing to harness and capture the sun's light. So the visible spectrum is 400 to 900 nanometers. And depending upon the materials, band gap determines how much it absorbs. So in the technology of like solar cells, there are wafer-based technology and then thin films. The most popular solar tech right now is with silicon, mainly because of the popularity with manufacturing. A lot of the technology inside of our cell phones and computers have silicon tech. So the manufacturing process has been well established. But thin film solar cells, <laughs> they have basically different material properties where they're usually direct band gap materials that allow them to better use the sunlight's energy. So just thinking about that graph once more, the relationship between energy and wavelength is speed length divided by wavelength. So the energy that's captured from that sort of depends on the spectrum of the sun that we're capturing. So the, the silicon material is at 10 to the 5, like right around 400 nanometers, which is like the beginning of the spectrum. But the CAD telluride has a high absorption coefficient in the higher spectrum. So you're able to use more of that towards photoconductivity. And maybe that's a, a good thing to sort of highlight is the nomenclature. I think ophthalmology has sort of really been my key to success in understanding the base and root words because sometimes the vocabulary can be really sort of daunting. So solar cells are often, that's like the layman's word, but they also are called photovoltaics. So sort of the, the photon from the sun being captured and converted into a, a vault or an electron vault or the energy source that we can use. So I think that that captures the difference between those two. And we could talk about the CAD telluride thin film itself. My research was basically in categorizing the CAD telluride absorber layer and sort of identifying where different defects and localized states lie. And those defects can impede the carrier's concentration that are transmitted so that they're part of like the electrical circuit. Do you think more cat cells in the future? 
I hope so, mainly because of like the niche applications. I think the different ways in which we can use the technology is probably what's going to attract more people into the sort of solar purchasing industry. I think the sort of generation one solar panels on your roof maybe have lost their allure. And that's why First Solar is probably going to set the bar for smaller companies to come. But there's one group, I think it's like Toledo Solar, they're sort of up and coming too. But uh, those thin films, like I'm sort of a proponent of like solar everywhere. <laughs> so like the building integrated photovoltaics, BIPV is really cool. I think the clothing that's integrated with solar is really cool. I mean, super niche. My research that brought me into the University of South Florida was on disensitized solar cells. So like that's the sort of organic chemistry side of solar tech. But my initial goal was to create uh, disensitized stained glass windows for like churches and things like that. It's really interesting. And yet the term thin film to me sounds very fragile. Stained glass windows, hope they would be protected, but are there ways of, of hardening the thin film so that they are kind of structurally really robust? I think the solar substrate, which is sort of the place that's at the base of the solar device, I think it's mainly the manufacturing process that could help with that challenge or barrier in developing the technology. You can do the substrates on like glass versus foil and one of the other barriers is the absorption uh, layer. So that's where the cadmium sulfur comes into play. And so they're adding selenium now, which sort of extends the band gap a bit more so that you can capture more of those photons. So I think that they're really sort of coming at it from different angles, but I think hardening the substrate is really important. And I guess it really depends on the application. Can you tell us about what you're doing recently in terms of business or policy? My business is something that I've had since 2016. My business partner is an industrial engineer, and he's uh, now getting his MBA. But basically, I'm the chief technology officer. And so because my background varies in different types of technology, and he's bringing the sort of business innovation side, we're able to consult and provide advice on different program development or project development initiatives. Having just finished my fellowship with the Department of Energy, that was what November of 2020. Basically, my company has been sort of ongoing. Being here in rural Virginia, it's been an opportunity to have a glimpse into a world that's underserved. As a human in our race having more melanin, I'm used to sort of representing the underserved community. Um, and my family having a rural background is something that I saw like in the summertime. But actually living here and sort of seeing the disparities has been quite uh, inspiring. So just before coming here, I was with the solar office for about two and a half years. And I started with the manufacturing and competitiveness team. So I've tried some technology transfer work and dealt with some patents. Like the reason why I went to USF is because my advisor holds a world record in the efficiency for CAD Telluride. So I was really big into commercialization and wanting to sort of get small businesses and, and different products off the ground. But after sort of having that internal experience, I think my goal is the same, but my approach had to had to pivot. So the goal is power to the people, harness the sun's energy as best we can, because we need new resources, not to completely shut out the old ones, but we need that innovation. So having switched to the soft cost team, which is sort of the non-hardware expenses, the categories that I sort of fell into were workforce development and community solar. So the workforce development angle and sort of the rural Virginia tie is that the grandfather, Ashley Bagley, who purchased this land, he was a coal miner. And sort of, I think that the importance of that power being given to the people is critical in how their life is joyful. So I think retraining the workforce that's here in rural places, as well as like the youth in like urban areas is sort of key to how successful we are. And so that workforce um, category scales up to entrepreneurship. So I sort of have a P through 12 concept and then undergraduate uh, community colleges, technical colleges, doctoral degrees up to sort of the skilled labor. So that's one thing that I've sort of been wanting to get better acquainted with how to sort of implement that now that I had the past experience and this current experience. And it sort of also ties in with the community solar work. 
it's really, really great that you are sharing this personal story and it really gives a lot of depth and meaning to the human dimensions of energy. Does it feel kind of like coming full circle now that you're in renewable energy and on the land and, and working with people? Yeah, I realized that I'm really sort of moving into my sophomore year of maybe life in my profession. And full circle is sort of the best description, but I picture it in my head as a sort of spiral that's going upward. I guess I've always sort of been super intentional on what I intended to do. So um, I was like, a, I was a total dork. So I did the uh, after school program, Maryland Mesa, which is math, engineering, science achievement. And then in high school, I did a technology transfer competition where Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab gave us some technology and we had to market it. And then undergrad, I did like the energy efficiency research. So my goal in everything that I do is to do good. And when I was sort of having the opportunity to choose my career. Engineering kind of got like a bad response from some people. Like you can either build something beautiful or build something that's super bad for everyone. So I, I wanted to make sure that as I learned this skill set, I'm doing it all for the right reasons and the reasons that I, I started with. I saw Kurt Vonnegut talk and he had a thing, he was talking about how engineers should have the equivalent of a Hippocratic oath and, you know, kind of like, you know, do no harm. There's something called the engineering society where they have like an engineering ring that sort of you wear to sort of symbolize that you, you plan to do no harm. I, I lost mine. So good reminder to, to get it again. Well, thank you so much for taking time today. I'm really glad we got to talk. It's great chatting with you. Nice. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>